Welcome to Amato's fifth quarter podcast. Listen to incredible conversations with former high profile AFL, A League, and NBL players who discuss their lives and respective professional sporting careers. Previous guests welcomed on the podcast include Dustin Fletcher, Al Green, Travis Storm, everybody, Tyson Edwards, Brett Maher, Dale Kicker, Eugene Greggins, Kevin Brooks, Jack Fitzpatrick, Bill McDonald, Sam Jacobs, Cal Brooks, Marcus Ferris, Sean Reddish, James McIntyre, Andrew Vlahov, Graham Corn, Brian Curl, Jason Ekamanis, Chris McDermott, Mike Ellis, Kevin Lich, Matt Smith, Michael Gould, Brendan T, Jordan McMahon, Brett Fett, Matt Shanahan, Rupert Stathwell, Dusty Lockhart, Sam Gibson, Ricky O'Loughlin, Dylan Addison, Daniel Dorjewski. Dom Tyson. Links to all previous episodes are down below for your listening pleasure. But without further ado, let's get into this next episode of Amato's Fifth Quarter. They've got a brand new stadium, a big one, and they're going to put a big flag up there in a moment because the Eagle has landed. They're the premiers in 20. There it is. Brisbane have won it. The orange order is restored. It took just one season of transition, but Brisbane Raw premiers, now title winners, champions of Australia. The 17-year drought is over. All hail the Kings. Sydney, the NBL 22 champions. 3-0 sweep, they win it, 97 to 88. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Welcome everyone to episode number 36 of Amato's fifth quarter podcast. I'm your host Dan and for today we are joined by a former AFL player from the GWS Giants, Melbourne Demons and North Melbourne Kangaroos. Dom Tyson. Throughout this conversation, we discussed the early years coming through the ranks at the Oakley Chargers in the TAC Cup before being drafted at pick number three for GWS in 2011 as a part of that inaugural GWS Giants squad in 2012. Some of his key moments as a Giant, including being part of that first ever game round one 2012 against the Sydney Swans and being a part of history, playing under legendary coach Kevin Sheedy and the decision to return home to Victoria after just two seasons as a Giant to join the previously struggling Melbourne. From there, we discuss the rebuild of the Demons, rising up the ladder each season, going from 17th in 2014 to a preliminary final appearance in 2018, and being a part of that climb up the ladder. Playing those three finals in front of big crowds, including the blowout loss to the West Coast Eagles in the 2018 prelim. Moving on to North Melbourne the next year, playing six games over three injury plague seasons under three different coaches at North Melbourne, as well as what he's doing now post-football in his new business venture, selling golf apparel at Clutch & Co. Throughout his time in the AFL from 2012 to 2021, Dom Tyson played 113 games across three clubs, scoring 45 goals, and he played in three finals. Let's get it underway from the GWS Giants, the Melbourne Demons, and the North Melbourne Kangaroos. It's Dom Tyson. Scary Tyson, he's kicked it a long way and accurately. It was brilliant from Dom. D's get their eight. Tyson on the natural left foot, and he's found his man. That was a clever kick from Tyson. Tyson. Now, there's no, there's only one man inside, but the big man Phillips is charging to give him a tall option. He's not going to power on. He went on his own, Tyson, and he got there with a mighty kick. Welcome back to Amato's fifth quarter, and today we are joined by a former AFL player for the GWS Giants, Melbourne Demons, and the North Melbourne Kangaroos, Dom Tyson. Thank you very much for joining us today. Good on you, Daniel, mate. The three clubs, it's a fair mouthful, but yeah, glad to be joining you on the podcast. Absolutely. You finished up playing in, in 2021, so you've been out of the system a little under two years. I understand you're an avid golfer and you also own a golf apparel brand, Clutch & Co. Can you give us a bit of information on this and also just what you're doing now in general post-football? Yeah, no dramas. Yeah, I finished up at the end of the 2021 season, obviously at North Melbourne. 
stuck around as a playing coach for VFL last season, which is 2022. And yeah, I had a hobby business whilst I was still playing footy, which was a yeah, golf apparel business. We, we've got a website there and I was able to transition into that full time once my duties as an AFL professional player finished up and I'm still sort of working hard trying to grow that. And footy-wise, I'm not super certain what I'll do for season 2023. I really enjoyed my year at VFL level, but just the risk of injury, mate. I'm, I'm nearly 30 now and I've sort of done my level two coaching accreditation and a few opportunities have popped up in the coaching space. So I'll just try and work out what's best to balance growing the business and also what I'll do on the footy side of things as well. So with your coaching, is going to... Is being an AFL coach or assistant coach or being in the AFL spectrum, is that something that appeals to you or you, you're just sort of taking it day by day? Uh, yeah, it's interesting because in that off-season that just went past the end of the 2022 season, I, I did get an offer at coaching level at AFL and, and obviously a few VFL offers. So it was something that I did need to assess if it's something that I'm interested in. But just where I'm at right now in my life and where I'm trying to grow my business, I just couldn't accept the full-time position it, it just would have been a too great of an opportunity cost for where my passion lies right now but yeah there's some part-time roles certainly in the coaching space that I'll, I'll pursue in 2023 I'm just trying to finalize where that will be so with your golfing apparel what does this more appeal to is it strictly your golf wear or have you got a bit of leisure gear there as well yeah, no, we sort of try and keep it relatively versatile in the, in the design. So we, we overlap into a bit of active wear with, with a lot of our fabrics, and, you know, our shorts, and quarter zip tops, like you can wear them going for a run. Yeah, active wear, as I said. But yeah, we, we generally, I thought, you know, when I first started the business, a lot of the golf apparel out there was either overpriced or very golf specific in what in how it presented, meaning, you know, very vertical stripes, horizontal stripes and yeah, loud yeah, colours yeah, which yeah, right, yeah. which meant, you know, if you if you head down to a cafe you in your golf polo it's clear that you're gonna go play golf or you just finished playing golf. But my sort of idea was to wear something that, you know, overlaps into some everyday use that doesn't stick out as if you've just been at a golf course. Yeah, awesome. And do you reckon you could give business a bit of a plug for those of the listeners who who maybe want to pick up some gear where yeah. they can find you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we're, we're Melbourne-based and we've got an online platform, which is a website called, oh, the, the link is www.clutchandco.com.au and we've got a few sort of stockers across the country now. So you're Adelaide-based, so I don't know if your, your viewership's mainly Adelaide or, or national, but yeah, we're, we're sort of in the golf clearance outlets and some pro shops here across Victoria. I'll put the link in the description, actually. Awesome, mate. That'd be great. Yeah, so we, I mean, it's the aim is we actually do go after that younger generation of golfer. We're probably tapered fits and, and we put a lot of stretch fabrics in there and you'll look good, feel good. Can't guarantee that you'll play good, but yeah, that's, that's sort of what the business is all about. Ah, beautiful. And So going to your football career, early days, you played under 12s for Victoria. You went to Oakley Chargers in the TIC Cup and then you went to the Giants when you were 18. Growing up, was football always your number one sport and did you always think that you could be good enough to make the elite level? It was definitely my, my favourite sport growing up. I grew up with a couple of brothers and I'm in the middle there. So, yeah, a lot of childhood was spent going to their games, playing my games. We loved our cricket as well. But then I probably hit probably 13, 14 when I realised, yeah, footy was something that I wanted to pursue professionally. You probably start making a few sacrifices socially to achieve that goal. And, and that's when I started taking it seriously. And then you obviously get involved in all the pathways. So the pathways, obviously which are getting more and more professional by the day. So I think as you see now, like a lot of the under 18s that come out of the national pathways, they're, they're ready to go. So I was obviously about 10, 12 years ago going through that. Yeah, they do a great job down at the PAC Cup level here in Victoria and yeah, really enjoyed juniors. And then it obviously gets very, very serious by the time you're you know, in year 11 and 12. Throughout this period towards the 2011 draft, you'd been likened and compared to the likes of Jimmy Bartel and Sam Black. So... Two pretty decent players. Did you always know at this time as you were coming through that you would be taken pretty early in the draft? And did you think at the time it was likely to be either GWS or perhaps Gold Coast? Yeah, well, probably starting my under-18 season, I was no guarantee to to even get drafted. I was probably viewed as maybe a late selection at the very start of that year. And I sort of had a really good year and started Oakley Chargers, fed into Vic Metro and played really good school footy as well. So... Yeah, I guess you just gradually climb the, the ranks. And towards the end of the year, the Giants, I think they had the first five selections in that year. And they did give me a little heads up a week or two out from the draft that I'd definitely be one of those five selections. But yeah, it probably wasn't until after the National 
carnival that I thought I'd, I'd sort of be in that, yeah, first 10 selections. When you were picked up, you were number three, weren't you? Correct, yeah. Yeah, number three for GWS, their first season in the league. What was it like when you officially made it onto an AFL list? Pick number three, GWS Giants. Player number 212-309, Dom Tyson, Oakley Chargers, Camberwell Junior Football Club. Even as a young tacker playing with Melbourne's Camberwell Sharks, Dom Tyson was a smart, instinctive midfielder who knew how to get, then knew the ball. Tyson is starting to exert his influence. Great kick. This year, the left footer has inked up the draft order with several fine performances in the under 18 carnival. Then later in the season, he again caught the eye of recruiters with 33 touches for the Associated Grammar Schools in the big clash against the Associated Public Schools. He is regarded as one of the cleanest young players in the country by hand and foot. Another charger headed for GWS, Dom Tyson. Yeah, I do remember the night. It's obviously a great moment for probably my family, more so than me. I'm already focused on the next steps and I just want to get into it. But it's obviously a great reward for probably my parents. They've done a lot of the heavy lifting through childhood and it's yeah, a good moment to share with them. And also being up there with a lot of other... The draft was in Sydney and we had teammates, had my schoolmate Adam Tomlinson also get drafted there. And I would played a lot of footy with Toby Green at Oakley Chargers and, you know, even other Vic Metro guys that we'd spent half a year with. So... It was a yeah, good moment to share amongst friends and I guess you drafted on probably a Thursday night, you fly back on a Friday and then you have a dinner or two and catch up with friends and then you, you pack your stuff and you fly back up Sunday, start training on Monday. So it all happens pretty quick once your name's read out. And being top draft pick and, and going over to GWS their first season, did you feel or do you feel the pressure of being a top draft pick that you have to perform or that you're expected to be all Australian, potential brown low, that sort of thing that comes with being high in the draft? Not really, because you're, you're amongst a lot of high draft picks that year. Giants that had the first five selections and then, you know, pick seven, pick nine, pick 10, pick 11. So you're just one of many in that uh, environment. And then I guess the external expectation on the Giants wasn't too great. Like it was honestly just about competing and, and learning the game. It wasn't really any expectation to win many games so it was all about development and that probably took the pressure off really from from a performance standpoint so they I remember the coaches early days just kept on encouraging us to bring our attributes and strengths and they weren't going to coach us too hard whether we obviously there's still a minimum standard of effort and expectation to the game plan but they weren't going to coach us too hard on wins losses. Well those first couple of seasons at GWS you had Yourself, Cornelio, Shill, Bug, Green, Cameron, Trelaw, Patton, or you're all the same age, you're all, you know, 18, 19. And even the recruits from other clubs, so Phil Davis, Callan Ward, Tom Scully, they were still very young. They might have only been, what, two, three, four years older. What was yep. it like being around so many young guys the same age as you? Did that make it easier to transition into full time football? Yeah, it was obviously great socially because you just had a lot of guys to hang out with and, I guess, do that early stage of adolescence together and. Sydney's a great part of the world to live. There's so much going on with beaches and bars, exploring. So that was a great aspect of having so many young guys. And then, yeah, you're in the same career journey from a football point of view. So as I mentioned, very development focused and you're learning all the little things of the game, the running pattern, the body positioning and all the things that you've got to do from a defensive team defense and individual defense that you might not have learned through juniors. So yeah, a lot of meetings that were probably stripped back to the very fundamentals because we had so many young guys so it was important to embed those learnings and what about being around Kevin Sheedy so one of the greatest football brains ever four premierships over 27 seasons at Essendon what was your relationship like with him and and what sort of an impact did he have on you early on in your career not a whole lot to be honest Sheeds was probably more of a figurehead during his time at the Giants and he had a probably greater role to grow the game of AFL football in a foreign part of Australia that wasn't Footy wasn't the number one sport there. AFL was more rugby league and probably soccer supporting sort of area. So, yeah, Sheets had his hands full there trying to gather sponsors and grow the game. So we had Mark Williams that did a lot of the technical side of coaching, but obviously Sheets would come in on game day and, and still be our you know, motivator. But in terms of the strategic parts of the game, it was definitely more choco. I'd say that had a, a greater impact for me. Yeah, that's a really interesting answer. So did you not spend a lot of one-on-one time with Kevin Sheedy or was he not around as much as what you would assume a senior coach is? Uh, no, you wouldn't do your, like, your match reviews or your one-on-one sort of coach meetings with Sheets. He'd be more, yeah, he'd be growing the game and 
outside of the footy club. So, yeah, we'd, we'd do a lot of the stuff with your assistant coaches, which I think mine at the time were James McDonald, Luke Power and, and Mark Williams. Choco Williams was almost certainly going to be the coach of GWS one day, and it seemed early on that that was going to be the case. And that just never ended up happening. It ended up going to Leon Cameron. Do you know why that never ended up happening? Because early on, it seemed that he was very involved with the club and it sort of just fizzled out. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure of the, the reasons. they well, Obviously, they appointed Leon Cameron to coach that second year under Sheets before the, you become the outright coach, the successor plan. But yeah, I couldn't put my finger on exactly what it was with Choco. He obviously, yeah, like a great sort of facilitator for the development of the game, but I'm not sure whether they thought he, he might not have been an ideal head coach in control of all decisions. But uh, yeah, I, I would, I'd only be speculating as to what the decisions and motives were there. All right, everyone, it's time for a quick break on A5Q. I want to talk about Cappuccino's, the perfect mobile cafe for your event catering needs. Established in 2019 in Adelaide, South Australia, Cappuccino's is our family business, here to provide you with freshly brewed, hot barista-made beverages on wheels, using locally roasted La Crema coffee beans with our preferred blend included for any event needs. Cappuccino's caters for weddings and engagements, sporting events, school, university and work functions and birthday parties, just to name a few. We pride ourselves not only on delivering warm, smooth and delicious coffee at a great price, but also fantastic professional customer service with a smile. If our customers walk away satisfied, it means our job has been done correctly. We also cater for meal deals including bacon and egg rolls, hamburgers and hot dogs upon request. If you're based in Adelaide and need catering for your next social event, book with Cappuccinos by visiting our website at www.cappuccinos.com spelled C-U-P-P-A-G-I-N-O-S, link in the description below, or contact us directly via phone at 0418 894 570 or email at cappuccinos at hotmail.com and don't forget to like us on Facebook and help spread the word. Now that we have that out the way, let's get back to the show. First game for GWS versus the Sydney Swans, so you started as the sub and although it was a 70 point loss, it was a very spirited and competitive performance from the Giants. What does that mean to you now 10 plus years later? to have been a part of that very first Giants game and what are your memories of that first ever game? Here we go, umpire Matt Stevick about to put it in the turf to get the GWS history underway. Giles the Ruckman to contest. I reckon that list is really exciting. Well, a turned one over here which is highly unusual. Falau backing out, opportunity for Ward on his non-preferred side. The first goal kicker for the GWS is their co-captain. This offline siren sounds. And the Sydney Swans have won the first game of the year against the debutants GWS. 14-16-100 to 5-7-37. It's obviously a proud moment to be involved in the club's first ever game. It's, I don't really do a lot of reflecting, but I guess you have history books forever which is a permanently I guess but yeah memories were Swans were very good very physical and very good and we yeah, it felt fast and I remember only coming on in the last quarter which I think the game was probably all but decided by then so it sort of felt like a little bit of a free hit for me to just run around and get used to the speed and the tempo and, and just try and get my hands on the ball when I was in the midfield. Did you immediately notice the difference from semi-professional football to professional AFL? Definitely. I remember just on the sidelines, yeah, it was probably more the physicality rather than the speed, so the velocity of the hits. I remember James McDonald came off the square and I think he might have clicked Luke Parker in the first centre bounce and that was sort of a moment on the sidelines. And obviously on the bench, ready to get on at some point. I'm just thinking, OK, look, make sure you're ready to go here and whatever you do, just do it quick. Those first two years you were at GWS, obviously on the field was quite hard, but did you ever anticipate how good that squad was going to be if you all stuck together. When you're getting so consistently smashed week in, week out on the field, do you think this is just going to go on forever or did you understand at that time that it was going to come good eventually? Yeah, I guess law of averages would suggest with so many high draft picks that are developing at the same age, there was going to be a period of time when everyone hits their prime at the same time. So the coaches were great, kept on saying, just remember and bank it when 
a team smashes you because in three, five years' time, you're going to get your revenge. So, yeah, I, I mean, you could see the fact that Jeremy Cameron and Trelaw and Shearley and Stevie Tobes, all these guys were going to be great AFL players. So, I guess we all could realise that 45 wasn't going to fit into 22. So, it was a bit, a bit more of which guys will be around versus which guys weren't. And it's definitely an awareness because it just from a mathematical point of view, 40 guys think they should be in the starting 18, but they've only got 18 spots and not everyone's going to be around. So what prompted your move to Melbourne? If my memory is correct, you had an injury and didn't play much in the second year. 2014 was, was your third year in the in the competition. You were at Melbourne. Was it you wanted to go home or were you searching for more opportunities? What was the reason for going to Melbourne? We have breaking trade news. Pick two in the national draft is now in the possession of Greater Western Sydney. And GWS has sent young gun Dom Tyson to Melbourne. Melbourne secures Dom Tyson plus pick nine and pick 53. So it means they still have a pick in the top 10 of the draft. The Demons have in return given the Giants three picks. Pick two, pick 20 and also pick number 72. Yes, we, we've uh, tried to pick two as part of a, part of a deal. Uh, very happy with the net effect. Uh, been able to bring in a, you know, Dom Tyson who's... A highly regarded uh, midfielder up at GWS. He's come in. We've been able to improve our draft position. I think in the end, he's uh, he's a tall midfielder, 187 centimetres. Uh, he fits in really well with our other midfielders, with Nathan Jones and Jack Viney, one of the smaller types. He's been, uh, you know, pick three previously. You know, very talented junior. He's had interrupted start to his AFL career with with two unrelated injuries, and we just see a lot of upside in him. I'd actually signed a two-year contract extension to stay at the Giants, so yeah, I was prepared to stay and stick it out there, but. An opportunity arose between Melbourne and the Giants where they discussed the trade and I was involved in that. So they, yeah, Melbourne presented that to me and, and sort of, yeah, offered me the fact that they're young and developing at the time as well and there's probably greater opportunities for me as a third year player at the Melbourne Demons than there might be at the Giants. I pretty much didn't really think about it for too long. I just thought, great, like I probably will get home at some stage. This is probably a bit earlier than I thought it would be, but yeah, let's do it. I was ready to sort of get back to Melbourne and spend more time with family and friends. Is it true there was interest from Richmond at that time? Yeah, I'd met Richmond the year before, so... Oh, the year before? Was, yeah, I went to Damien Hardwick. I remember going to his house with a, a group of sort of senior players at the time, and they'd done a presentation for me, but back then, it, that would have been probably the first draftee to get traded one year into their contract, just something that hadn't happened before, so was sort of squashed pretty early from the Giants that they weren't going to do that. The only two I can think of is Tom Boyd and... Horn Francis. Yeah, that's the one, Horn Francis, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that, that yeah, that was like a, not to probably the level of those guys type of deal, but it was sort of something to do, something like that, where you probably have to release your first round draft pick and a good player. You couldn't trade future picks or anything like that. Fair call. Cool. So you, you did end up going to Melbourne. Arguably, well, at that time, they were arguably in the biggest hole a club has been in in recent years to be honest in terms of on field they hadn't played finals for years they had three or four coaches sacked in the last five or six years before then constantly getting smashed on the field poor crowds they were going through a significant development process with Paul Ruse coming in what was the vibe like walking into a place which had suffered so much on field recently yeah it was pretty upbeat to be honest like the guys were just so ready to turn the corner and Ruse coming in was just great for probably retention and attraction of other players, staff members. So, yeah, there was a bit of a buzz and everyone knows with the footy environment, like things can turn quickly. So there's so much turnover at the end of a year between players, coaches, strength and conditioning staff. It actually feels like a new environment every year. And I was just part of a new group that was coming in for that 2014 season and the past wasn't something that was on my radar. It wasn't something that I'd been through. So whether a few other guys had a bit more baggage or not, potentially, but for me, it was just a clean slate, ready to go, get stuck in. Yeah, because that 2014 season, now you look at it, that was the start of what became the 2021 Premiership, really, because 14 season with Paul Roos is really what set the foundation for what was to come. Definitely, yeah. There was a lot of core guys there, like Viney and Maxi Gorn and Tommy McDonald and, and those types of guys that were, were there, and they were all there before me as well, so... And then I think that first year of draft picks, a tracker and Angus Brayshaw. So, yeah, and then Simon Goodwin obviously came in at the, sort of as a transition successor to Ruzi. So, yeah, the core of it was all there and the pathways were there and they obviously executed very, very well in 2021. So you had a great first season at Melbourne. You played every game and, and you came second in the best and fairest, in which, albeit that season, 
for Melbourne as a whole, they only won four games, but it was actually a positive step, as we mentioned, as to getting to that 2021 Premiership. Did you feel that was the season for you where you arrived, per se? Yeah, I, I felt like I'd, you know, you're never super, super comfortable at AFL level because it's so so hard, but I, I definitely felt like I'd become like a, a best 22 type player that contributes at AFL level and for me, mate, I wasn't super fit or super quick. I just sort of was playing on confidence and got into a bit of a rhythm. And yeah, just everything flowed from there, really. I wasn't overthinking anything and expectations were still low. So I could just go and play and yeah, had a, had a good year. Similar to the question I ask with GWS is, could you see the good things coming? I know you you weren't there for the really tough years prior to this, but did you feel internally that the club was heading in the right direction? Because that year... They brought in Daniel Cross, Bernie Vince, Chris Dawes, just for some experience, and there were some really good draft picks and the young players coming through. Did you feel that things could turn quickly? Or, again, when you're in a situation where you're losing games constantly, do you think to yourself, I'm just in a bad team and that's just how it's going to be? No, you can see it turning for sure. Like Someone like Crossy was massive for the group because he just brought over a work ethic that not many had seen before, like myself included. So young guys could just piggyback off the back of someone like Crossy and then... Bernie always played with a ruthlessness, so he was an important pickup. Yeah, straight away you could see that the tracker, Brayshaw, were going to be stars. And the one that would probably shock me the most would have been Gorney. I mean, I know Ruckman take a few extra years, but when I got there, he was probably in and out of the first and seconds and hadn't really had a breakout game. And for him to become what he's become, like it's probably the greatest sort of growth that I would have seen in such a short time. Because back then, who was Melbourne's number one ruck? Was it still Mark Jamer? Yeah, he played as the number one, and then even Jake Spencer would have been the number two seed for a little while there ahead of Gorney. Oh, and even Jack Fitzpatrick. Yeah, he was more forward ruck, but yeah, Gorney was definitely down the pecking order. It's amazing what he's become now. Yeah, so he trained hard, but um, it was his marking that probably let him down, and then he suddenly just chipped away, and yeah, I remember by 2015, 2016, he was probably the best marking ruckman in the AFL. So in though, as as we're going through, in, and Melbourne gets progressively better every year. So 17th in 2014, 13th in 15, 11th in 16. Simon Goodwin takes over in 2017. You just missed the finals. And then you finally make the eight in 2018. Can you talk to us about those years and the development of players like yourself, Petrarca, Oliver, Brayshaw, Gorn, Harm, Salem? What was it like to sort of grow up with these guys and all develop together into really solid footballers? I guess the foundations had been set and we were just getting better because we were training more together and we were implementing a game plan that has compound effects where you you need to get used to spacing and each other's patterns. So the core group remained the same and you could just see improvements. And then the thing was probably the best set of players were literally, you know, Clayton and he was winning best and fairest by then. So yeah, they were the real drivers where the guys probably under 20, you know, Jack Viney had won a best and fairest by 22 and yeah, Clayton Gorney. So the core group, you can tell was yeah, ready to launch. Halftime break here on Amato's fifth quarter podcast. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank everyone who has tuned into the show. The support is very much appreciated and I hope this episode is finding you well. If you're enjoying the show, it would be a massive help if you could consider subscribing and leaving a rating and a review. Gaining as much positive feedback as possible helps feed the podcast algorithm and boost the show's visibility, which will therefore allow for other Australian sports tragics to see and listen to the show. Five stars, of course, would be fantastic, but I'll leave that up to you. Now, enough of that. Let's get back into it because the second half of A5Q is about to get underway. Twenty eighteen, as we mentioned, is when Melbourne finally break through and they play finals for the first time since two thousand six. Out of that squad, Nathan Jones was the only man who'd actually played in a final series with Melbourne. The two finals, elimination final against Geelong, semi final against Hawthorne, and you make a prelim against West Coast. Can you talk to us and sort of describe to some of the listeners what finals football is like? Because especially you played big finals at the MCG in front of big crowds. What is that like compared to say a home and away season game? It's been their night. Melbourne have beaten Geelong in the elimination final on their way to the semi. Well, as you say, Bruce, they're going to Perth. 
Guess what? The last team to beat West Coast in Perth, the Melbourne Footy Club. Just wait for this. Wait for this now. Yeah, I mean, I've only played the three. Yeah, from my point of view, it was just everything's just a bit quicker. I remember with Jordan Lewis, he'd obviously come across from Hawthorne. He I remember him saying something to us before the first final. It was basically like, don't go looking for something that's not there, boys. Like, it's just another game of footy. Yeah, it might be a little bit quicker, but a little bit more physical. But don't be overawed by the situation. Just go and play to what we've been doing because I think we'd sort of come into that final series in good form. Even though we might have finished fifth, so we'd missed miss the four, but uh, we felt like we were playing some good footy. So it was mainly just confidence and the fact only Jonesy and probably Jordan Lewis had played finals from that group and probably Bernie was in that. Bernie might have been involved by then still, but yeah, it was probably guys playing on a bit of naivety and ignorance that probably allowed us to go so well because you could just go out and play. It seemed like you were just peaking at the right time and... And it was almost like a Western Bulldogs 2016 feel of, is this the fairy tale? Like, can Melbourne actually do this? Because to win four finals and, and win a premiership from outside the top four is very, very hard. Do you allow yourself to think in that moment, gee, we could actually do this? Or is it very much one game at a time? Yeah, it's a good question because I, I actually broke my wrist on my forearm between round 23 and the final series. So as much as I'd love to say I was thinking big, I really wasn't because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get up and play. So for me, my memories were a lot of, yeah, just trying to get my wrist, my forearm just healed enough. Like I still played with the broken arm there, but um, yeah, I'd put a plate in. So I was sort of, yeah, focused on just getting up to play and then recovering to get up and play again. But I mean, looking back, we obviously met a red hot West Coast side in that prelim over there and it was a hot day, early game, so... They were far better than us, mate. I remember thinking that was that was us meeting a team that was another level that day. So we just got bounced, and I don't know, I don't know how we would have gone the next week. But West Coast went on to win it, so we didn't beat them. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the prelim. So come in sort of full of confidence, and it just sort of completely falls apart. A sixty-six point loss. What do you think? I mean, obviously West Coast won the premiership that year, so they were a great team, and it probably didn't help that the game was a Saturday afternoon game. What do you think happened in that game? The ball's held alive. The second brilliant final. Smith, Oliver, dangerous place to handball the footy, but Jones makes it work. Lewis, speak about dangerous handballs. Chopped out by Kennedy. First blood, West Coast. And that's out of bounds, but there's your siren. The West Coast Eagles are through to the 2018 grand final. They were fresh. We were probably, oh, looking back, potentially overachieving a little bit early. And, and they were just, you know, in red-hot form. Darling, Kennedy, Shuey, Hearn, Nat Nui. I don't know, oh, Nat Nui might have missed, but, but yeah, just a lot of guys that were, yeah, probably in the absolute prime of their careers. And we were still young, but, yeah, I mean, oh, I could, they, they were probably just a better side, if I'm being brutally honest. That prelim was your final game for Melbourne. Did you know at that time that was it for you at the club? Because... At that point, you were actually still contracted, weren't you? Yeah, I did have one more year left on my deal. So been, I'd been dropped at that stage, so I wasn't 100% certain of where they viewed me. Yeah, I, I, looking back, I, I wouldn't have thought when I played that was going to be my absolute last game. But it, yeah, it ended up being that. So how did North Melbourne come about? Well, Cam, a pretty good way to end the week. Another trade's gone through. Yeah, it's great to acquire Dom Tyson and add him to our midfield mix for 2019. What was it about Dom that sort of caught your eye? Uh, oh, look, there's a few things with Dom. He's a, you know, he's obviously very, very clean, um, one-touch midfielder. Uh, adds to our stoppage mix and midfield mix, and and also too, he's a hundred-game player. Uh, you know, 25 years of age, so um, you know, should be in his prime of his career. Sort of an inside midfielder, but can play outside as well. How do you see him complementing the midfield group? Yeah, look, I think you know he he sort of mixes it well with you know sort of Cunners and Benny Jacobs and, and those guys and, and obviously we've been able to acquire some guys a little bit on the outside as well so you know we're trying to certainly trying to bolster our midfield we've been pretty uh, steadfast on that and, and Dom certainly does that. Basically in my exit interview with Melbourne and they said look you're probably going to be fighting for a 
spot in the best 22 and guys like the tracker the tracker actually wasn't playing midfield at that stage and they yeah said, he was still that half forward role wasn't he he was he was but obviously like Viney, Brayshaw and Oliver were, were through the midfield by then and I was sort of playing more as a wingman and they sort of mentioned that they were going to go and recruit specific wingmen like Langdon and I think they might have got Colin Ashley those type of guys so they said I was going to be up against it to maintain my spot in the side but they'd uh, encourage me to explore my options now and yeah that's where I met a few teams and yeah, the North option was probably the one that appealed to me the most. Yeah, with Alyssa, it was on the edge of the eight at the time. And then just the security of it, I think I got a three-year deal there. So that was what I chose. Because at that stage, as you said, North Melbourne weren't... Obviously, the last few years have been a bit tough. But at that point, they were sort of in between that ninth and twelfth spot. So the chance of, of North Melbourne playing finals in 2019 wasn't beyond the realms of possibility. That's right. Yeah, they sort of I remember when they I had my meeting with them. They sort of said like they thought they were right there on the edge, and they were bringing in Jared Pollock, Jasper Pittard, myself, and Aaron Hall. As those we were all about twenty six to twenty eight at the time, so they sort of thought we would sort of complement their existing list, and they'd have a red hot crack at making the top eight and playing finals. So that first season at North Melbourne, Brad Scott was still the coach. Now you played the first couple of games, and then you got injured. I did. I, I um I hurt my calf. That was actually me done for the season until I got back for the last game of the year to play VFL footy and I dislocated my shoulder, which required a full reconstruction. So I didn't have much luck that year. When Brad Scott left the club midway through the season, I'm really interested to hear your perspective of that because that's almost like a half insider, half outsider point of view. What was your view of that situation? Several weeks ago, the football department led by Brad and Cameron Joyce, presented a plan to the board regarding the future direction of the team. Included in this was an option from Brad to step aside as the senior coach. After further discussions with the board, the board reconvened on Friday morning and agreed with Brad that the time was right for him to step aside and we accepted his offer. Thanks very much, Ben. It's, um... It's been an absolute honour and a privilege to coach this great club uh, for 10 years. Uh, when we first started this journey 10 years ago, uh, the club was in a, a significant period of renewal. Uh, we weren't in the current facility that we're in now. We were, I knew we had some challenges at the time, but it wasn't until I was here I realised the enormity of, of those challenges. Um, Primarily at the time, we were we just staved off uh, a relocation um, and we were looking to put roots into the ground to, to ensure and enshrine North Melbourne's presence here at Arden Street um, for not just generations, but but hopefully for centuries to come. Scotty, I can I just remember thinking he's, he handled himself so impressively throughout. I think the boy between himself and the GM, Cam Joyce, had probably put their knackers on the line with the way that they'd recruited and geared the side for making finals that year and the team obviously didn't start well so I think he just jumped before he was potentially pushed but you know he, he was an absolute pro and spoke very well about the situation so I think it was very amicable between him and the board and he'd done his 10 year stint as a head coach and I guess sometimes that's probably a decent whole number that might say that you've you've given it a, a red hot crack at one environment and, and that's probably all you, you've got. Yeah because going into that 19 season it was pretty much you could say it was like finals or bust, wasn't it? That's right. The first half wasn't great, and that was pretty much the writing on the wall for him. If he didn't leave, he probably would have been asked to leave. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, I, I'm sure he got along really well off the board by being there for so long, but I'd say, um, yeah, they probably wouldn't have renewed his contract. So, Reese Shaw takes over for the rest of 19 and then again in 20. Of course, 2020, the COVID year, you, you didn't play a game under Reese Shaw. How was your view of this time? And, and obviously, we don't have to go into his situation, but how did you sort of see his unfortunate departure from the club and, and the issue there? Yeah, it's definitely a tough year all around there for everyone, not just footballers, but he was a great assistant coach, Shorey, and got along really well with the boys from a you know relationship point of view when he was work ethic was great. I think, I mean, probably me speaking, he probably, as he became a senior coach, I reckon he probably went away from a few things that made him a great assistant coach, which happens a lot. He wouldn't be the only one that's done that. He probably tried to bring in a, a pretty strong ruthlessness to the group very quickly. Not that there was pushback to that, but I guess with so much going on externally that 
it probably became pretty hard to implement that style of, of coaching when the world was sort of flipped upside down. So, And then, yeah, there were some significant injuries, like someone like Benny Cunnington, I don't think played much that year at all. He was sort of the backbone of the whole team, really, that year. He was sort of the most important player, and he barely got on the field. And yeah, then, I guess, yeah, just the external factors at play with the whole COVID being in a hub situation, everything was just heightened and snowballed from there. Yeah, and I've had a, a few players that in the system during the COVID time. What was it like for you personally? I know you were you were injured, but that time was just, you know, you had that first round in front of no crowds and then everything shut down. Does, what sort of a toll did that take on a professional athlete? Yeah, well, for me, I, the timing of it actually benefited me from a playing point of view because I was still very underdone coming back from a cast and shoulder. So that initial lockdown period allowed me to sort of step up my training although it was sort of you know in one-on-one or isolated I could try and get fit and yeah from a professional athlete point of view like we obviously got back to training I think they gave us three weeks there to train as a group before round two which was enough time but I I broke down in that three-week period with my calf again and then I think we went up to Queensland for the next 10 or 11 weeks and I probably pushed it probably halfway through my rehab again and just got a reoccurring strain that meant that I was out for the season but yeah, it wasn't until probably the last week or two where yeah, I realised that I wasn't going to be able to play that whole year. So it was sort of a difficult one, but I still had the carrot of trying to get back and play that whole time. I was up in the hub from an individual point of view. So it wasn't wasn't as if I was disengaged or, or struggling. Like I, I still wanted to get fit and do my rehab. And I guess being up in the hub in Queensland was still probably maybe a better scenario than being in lockdown in Melbourne. So we, we sort of took the positives. Before we get into the final stretch of this episode, we need to take one more break here for three-quarter time on A5Q. Now, this podcast is partnered with Pete and Pedro, the kings of men's hair and beard grooming. The days of the caveman are now over, gentlemen. We all need to keep on top of our hygiene, cleanliness, and style. Unfortunately, most chemist store products do not really achieve this efficiently. If you want high-quality results, you need high-quality products. Pete and Pedro... Established in 2013, offers premium hair and beard grooming products and tools that will actually get in there, moisturize, rehydrate, and clean your scalp, hair, and beard thoroughly without burning a hole in your wallet. From shampoos and conditioners to hair gels and putties, beard oils, combs, brushes, and even nail clippers, Pete and Pedro has it all. Now, I would never promote or partner with a brand I did not use or trust. Guys, I've been using Pete and Pedro products for years now and can confidently say there are no better hair and beard products on the market. Gentlemen, if you are looking to take your grooming game to that next level without breaking the bank, do yourself a favor and check out Pete and Pedro. And if you use my special discount code, DMATO10, spelled D-A-M-A-T-O-1-0, you'll score yourself an extra 10% off on what is already a great deal. The link to Pete and Pedro is down in the description below. But for right now, let's get back to the show. 2021, you played another three games. What happened that year? Yeah, I got fit, got healthy, had a really good pre-season. I was actually in the starting midfield for round one of that 2021 season and I played the first two games. Felt I just needed a little bit longer to get back used to the speed because I would barely played for the previous two years, so... By the time then, I was 28 and your team was in a rebuild phase, so you're not really afforded the luxury of getting your, getting your feet back on the ground for a month or six weeks that, that you might be afforded as a youngster. So unfortunately, I got dropped and I think I might have played a couple of VFL games before my calf gave way for a third time of a tendon strain, which is like a 10 to 12 week injury. So that was the third time that had happened in three years. And I actually remember getting back play. I probably had about a month left to sort of try and prove it. You know, I was worthy of another contract and I remember actually having a really, really good game at VFL level, which was one of those combined games where you'd mesh with another team or two to play, like an unofficial sort of scratch match. And then, yeah, played really well and thought I was a chance for selection and I ended up needing knee surgery off that game for a torn meniscus. So that sort of spelt the end for me from an AFL point of view. David Noble's the coach that year. How, how does that delisting process work? Are you just brought into an office and they say your services are no longer required? How does that process happen? Yeah, well, you've obviously got a manager that's in contact with the club throughout the year and 
they give you a fairly good indication of whether they think there's going to be another contract or not. And I mean, look, if you're, if you're out of contract still by the end of the year, you're over 25 and you're not playing regularly, and there's probably enough hints there to suggest which way it was going to land. And definitely, I was super injury prone. So, yeah, mine was a bit more of a official discussion rather than a, yeah, me getting caught by surprise. I sort of saw the writing on the wall. And looking back, I was definitely, definitely the right decision because I, yeah, was ready for the next phase of my life. And that was, yeah, allowed me to officially get on and get on with other things. So it wasn't like you had an ill feeling towards David Noble or North Melbourne. It was just something you were content with and you knew time to move on. Yeah, definitely. I understood the rationale and the process and that and how they'd reached that decision. That was if I was in there, you know, as a list manager, then I wouldn't have renewed myself on based on the previous history, my age, all, all the factors. This North Melbourne experience, you were on the list for three seasons and, and you played six games in three seasons. You had three different coaches as well. You had your injury issues and then you were delisted. How do you reflect on this North Melbourne experience? Yeah, it certainly had its challenges with just everything that you mentioned there, but it's a pretty unique club, like a really good group of boys that, yeah, there's no egos in that playing group. So I, re- I enjoyed my time there without actually playing, but yeah, I certainly would have liked to have made more of an imprint on, on field as wearing the North Melbourne jersey, but uh, yeah, that wasn't to be. Injuries are something that heavily impacted your career, particularly towards the end. What is more difficult with injuries? Is it the physical, emotional, or the mental side of it? Oh, no, for me, it was always the physical. Like, I, I like being active even outside of footy, you know, playing golf, going for walks and doing all the things outside of footy. But, yeah, mentally, I sort of, yeah, felt like the club always tried to do the right thing by you and you always had great resources available. So, you you know, mentally, I was confident I was, gonna, was always going to get my injury right. And then probably looking back, yeah, physically, I was probably a little bit impatient at times, and particularly with calf injuries, they're very temperamental. So that first one that I did, I, I definitely got back playing far too soon. And yeah, then I probably learned by the second one, but that was the COVID year, and we sort of were forced to rush it. And then the third one, that one was just probably the fact that I had a, just an overall weakness by then in the strength part of my, my leg there. So yeah, I'd, I'd say to answer your question, it was probably for more, more me physically because I just like being so active. And if you could go back and do your career again, what's the number one thing that you think you would do differently? Oh, this, I, I don't really think like that, to be honest, because you, you only really know what you know at the time and everyone would do a lot of things differently, I guess, with the benefit of hindsight and reflection. So there's nothing really that I'd do. Like Whether I'd stick at Melbourne for that one extra year of my contract would be the only moment there where you, do you back yourself in to stick around and fight your way back to the 22 or... Looking back, I was probably ready for a change. I was sort of, yeah, probably not enjoying my footy as much as I had. So I was I was happy to make that move. So I don't regret that decision. But yeah, I guess you you probably have, if you watch Doctor Strange, there's always multiple universes, mate. So you you never know which one you could land in. But that's just how it all played out. And there's no, no regret or anything I'd change. Nah, fair call, cool, definitely. Just as we are about to close up now, Dom, i got three last questions. In your entire AFL career for any club, who is the best player you ever played with and why? Who's the best player you ever played against and why? And lastly, who's the best coach you ever played under and why? Well, best player, like it, it probably would be Gorney for someone that impacted the games the most that I played in. So he was like a dominant force in some games just with his tap work and his marking ability. So I'd say it was probably, yeah, Gorney's best game was probably the most impactful game I would, I would witness firsthand. Best player played against... The guy with the most amount of presence was always Buddy Franklin. Like you just planned for him the whole week out. Whoever got given the role on him, you know, you'd be stirring that bloke up all week. So he was probably the guy that we paid most attention to. Probably for me, like in the midfield, there it was the really hard runners were always the ones that thought, "God, this guy can just go again here." So playing on Kieran Jack one day at Sydney, he just kept going. Dan Hanbury was the same. Those types of guys. And then last question: Who was the best coach? Probably tactically, Simon Goodwin, or he probably taught me the most. And then from a motivational point of view or human point of view, like it's a good question. Like Nobes' first year at North, I actually thought he was a really very measured and, and delivered great messaging and was very consistent. So that's probably my answer to those three. Awesome. Dom Tyson, it's been fantastic to have you on the show. I really appreciate your time. I wish you all the very best with Clutch & Co and everything you're doing now out of football. Awesome, Daniel. Thanks, mate. And, and likewise with the podcast. Hope it grows and it's huge.
And that is a wrap for another episode. I trust you enjoyed this conversation and I thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and a review. And I'll catch you all on the next episode of Amato's Fifth Quarter Podcast.